I think people coming from a financial sector had a really great benefit and also probably an advantage also of other people because they were just good with numbers. They could analyze it. But now it's, I think, more about understanding the story that the numbers are telling you. And I think that this is a bit of a broader marketing discipline. So to really fully understand how this all is connected to each other. Welcome to Mobile Growth and Pancakes, a podcast by Stormaven. We break down how and why mobile apps grow. In each episode, we invite a mobile growth expert onto the show to break down a specific mobile growth strategy, how it worked, why it worked, and what they would do differently. I'm your host, Esther Schatz. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mobile Growth and Pancakes. I'm your host, Jonathan Fishman. I'm VP Marketing at Stormaven. I know that you're used to hear Esther's voice, uh, but she's on maternity leave, so uh, we let her deal with baby things and we'll be happy for her. Uh, Today, I'm here with uh, Thomas, uh, co-founder and CEO of AppRadar. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Jonathan. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, For sure. Uh, Thomas, do you want to uh, introduce yourself a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, So my name is Thomas Krivanek. I'm the CEO and co-founder over here at AppRadar. Um, kind of the, the story of AppRate is a little bit bound to my personal story, uh, to my personal career development. Uh, kind of already during my studies, I, um, I specialized in the field of online marketing, digital marketing, and I was working in different uh, companies, building up uh, marketing departments there, uh, always with the goal of selling products through the internet. And in the year 2013, uh, I would say with the birth of hyper-casual gaming, uh, this was also the uh, the year for me when I also switched my focus uh, towards the mobile ecosystem. When I started first uh, releasing my own games uh, to the app stores and was uh, developing apps together with some friends. Um, and... Uh, Eventually, some of them also were quite successful, uh, which led me then to, um, yeah, uh, digging uh, a little bit deeper, uh, so to say, into this area, uh, which then uh, also resulted in that I was uh, working as a consultant together with multiple uh, apps as well as games, uh, helping them with their growth challenges. So most of them focused around the topic of abstract optimization. Until I came to the point that I had so many requests on my plate that I couldn't handle them anymore on my own. And this is when I needed to scale myself, uh, scale up myself. myself. Uh, and this was kind of the, the birth of AppRadar uh, when I teamed up uh, together with a good friend of mine and we were building the first version of AppRadar uh, with the goal of building a tool that helps app marketers with their day-to-day job to become more successful and to also streamline their work and make it more efficient. Um, since then, uh, we have grown quite well, I would say. We're now around 45 people uh, working for AppRadar and we're helping mobile apps as well as mobile games all around the world grow. Awesome. Pretty interesting. I remember when I entered uh, the industry and started working uh, in Storm Event, you were one of the first people that reached out to me uh, to partner up. Uh, so I'm happy that we're still in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, I would say the the the... the the, the core of the industry, probably. Let's put it like this. Uh, yeah, for there, sure. are, there, <laughs> there are some people and uh, those people know each other, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a ride. It's fun being in an industry that changes uh, so fast. Um, way more interesting. Before that, I was uh, working uh, in like consulting for EY. So that industry doesn't change. Uh, so I'm really <laughs> happy that we're uh, doing uh, mobile marketing. Um so today we want to talk a bit about uh, two tectonic shifts that are happening in the industry. Um, I think they're the biggest shift that happened uh, since uh, the industry was was created, basically. One of them is uh, the, the shift into a privacy-centric or privacy-first marketing and advertising uh, environment um, that uh, basically about a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, Apple... Um, shook the industry by telling everybody that they can't really share the IDFA or any user level data with anyone else, including their attribution providers or ad networks for targeting. Um, And the second shift is the move into an app store centric world where marketers need to think about the app store and deal with the app store as a, a major user acquisition engine um, with all the new capabilities that Apple is introducing with iOS 15. 
Um, so let's start with um, with uh, privacy first. Um, how do you think that marketers should deal with uh, with the change, both marketers and user acquisition folks, uh, where they're losing the ability to reach their high quality users um, by you know, uh, targeting on, on Facebook, for example, with lookalike audiences is not possible anymore. I mean, it's, it's weaker, mm. significantly weaker. Um, and all this chatter about contextual marketing and contextual advertising. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, with the, the big changes that were introduced uh, by Apple last year, uh, I would say during the breakout of the first Corona lockdowns, uh, I mean, it also took some time then uh, from the first announcement until uh, they also released iOS 14.5. Um, and there was also a bit of uh, yeah, a time gap uh, in between, so to say. But nevertheless, uh, I think that the industry itself was quite well prepared in some kind of way that there is, uh, like you mentioned, I, I would also say that the biggest change that happened actually in the, in the industry, uh, especially within the advertisement uh, space of it, uh, user acquisition uh, especially. Yeah. Um, so I think the move that we have been seeing here is uh, going away from um, from possibilities that were mainly powered by artificial intelligence, uh, by having the chance to target lookalike audiences, by ha having the chance to run 20,000 different uh, ad uh, creatives against each other and letting the AI decide which one converts the best and also brings in the most money at the end of the day. Uh, I think we have been moving away from this uh, to, uh, I would call it a little bit more of a true marketing discipline again, because I think that uh, obviously AI and all the data is still uh, very important uh, in the day-to-day -day job of every app marketer out there. But I think that uh, disciplines like creativity, like really thinking th through good strategies for good campaigns, so campaigns that really influence people out there that uh, get them going and not uh, because uh, green is converting better than orange, for example, on the button, um, that uh, this is becoming more and more, uh, yeah, I would call it true marketing again, because it's really about uh, what do you advertise? Uh, what is the benefit for the, for, the, for the customer, for the user out there? Why should they care? How do you help them? Uh, what is it exactly that gets them moving? So I think, uh, therefore, yeah, the discipline is getting a little bit more, uh, I would say, um, yeah, true and uh, also a bit more old-fashioned again, uh, like marketing was back in the days when there weren't that many tracking possibilities like we have seen over the last years. Yeah, for sure. I, I think we can break it down to two things. First of all, um, reaching your quality users. Um, I think that the IDFA or any user-level data was kind of like the... The industry was addicted to it. It's kind of like fossil fuels. Um, you're addicted to it. You know it's bad for you. You know that it's not feasible uh, and sustainable long term. Uh, but the value of it was so big that the, the industry couldn't let go. And uh, and what that value was, it, it was basically the ability to tell Facebook, hey, these are the users that that they want, uh, users that made an in-app purchase, that finished a level, that uh, registered for my app, uh, bringing more users like that. And Facebook basically had an insane user graph, knowing what everyone is doing on every app, because everybody w was reporting to Facebook and other networks, um, these behavioral um, events. And, and they could match users in a way that no human could. Um, there's Eric Seufert wrote about it, I think, a couple of months ago, that if you would put uh, the real audience, the, the real lookalike audience that Facebook created in one room, you could never tell uh, the commonalities between these people. Uh, it's not like you can translate it to you know, a certain demographic uh, or something like that. And uh, and now there's a question of how do you reach these high quality users? And I like it when you say true marketing because um, it, it just begs the question of where are my high quality users are coming from and at which context? If I'm, um, I don't know, a hidden object game, am I getting a lot of high quality users uh, from people that seeing my ads in match three games in, I don't know, hyper casual games and, and where they're coming from? Um, and because in the past, um, the, the network, let's say Facebook, did most of the work of getting users to, uh, getting you high quality users that have a, 
extremely high intent. I mean, the, the creative didn't have to do a lot to convince them to install because they're so interested in what you have to offer. And now the creative needs to really, really uh, influence these people to, to install. So uh, I like it when you say true marketing. Uh, what do you think about like the next uh, generation of user acquisition people? I mean, in the past few years, we were used to see these kind of analysts, like people that who, you know, you could even expect to find these kind of people in, in, in finance, like analyzing stocks. Um, what do you think like the skills of, that UA people in 2022 and beyond would need? Yeah, uh, so I think that uh, a really good point that you brought up here is um, with uh, understanding, uh, I would say, kind of the user journey, kind of the user flow, uh, which is bringing into this contextual um, yeah, dependency, so to say. And I think that uh, having the understanding or having the possibility to draw uh, user journeys to really understand from what is the trigger point. Uh, so for example, um, when we think of uh, just recently, I had a good conversation with a good friend of mine who is running a calorie counting app business. And uh, there we were also brainstorming around these ideas and uh, coming to the point uh, where we just said, yeah, I mean, it really depends. Uh, if you have a calorie counting app, then that's the thing that you do with it. But it's not that, you know, out of a sudden come to the conclusion, hey, I want to count calories. There is some kind of trigger point that brings you to this point. And uh, this might be, for example, that you want to lose weight because of social pressure or because you just want to get more healthy it can also be a possibility or you just want to become fit, uh, for example. So there are different motivations out there that trigger you to exactly... Um, this is something, a problem uh, that I want to have uh, to have solved uh, on Facebook, for example. I see a good creative, I see a good video um, that exactly catches my thought in this moment uh, where I just thought to myself, hey, that's exactly what I have been thinking about. And uh, kind of this app looks interesting. And then it's about yeah, clicking on the, the ad and then downloading the app within the app store and then starting to count calories to get to the research which the initial, so to say, starting point was the, I want to become more healthy, for example. And so therefore, I think that being able to draw those points and being able to also fully understand uh, not only uh, a marketing message, but also really within the product, uh, the complete uh, user journey that is happening there. So to really understand what is the value that we're providing to our uh, users out there. How can we trigger them? What is what matters really the most uh, for them, so to say? I think being able to understand this and uh, coming more now, I would probably even call it from a very ph philosophical point of view, yeah, to this uh, to this point. So having this broad marketing understanding, broad marketing knowledge, I think will be. Uh, just a must-have uh, compared to being only able to analyze uh, yeah, data, for example, like you mentioned. Yeah, uh, in the past, uh, uh, I think people coming from a financial sector had a really great benefit and also probably um, yeah, an advantage also of other people because they were just good with numbers. They could analyze it. But now it's, I think, more about... Uh, understanding the story that the numbers are telling you, so to say. And I think that this is a bit of a broader marketing discipline. So to really fully understand uh, how this all is connected to each other. Yeah, wow, well, that's, that's an amazing insight. I mean, that's uh, a great, uh, great takeaway here. Like understanding the story the data tells you and not just blindly allocating budgets to where you see a higher ROAS, for example. Being exactly. Machine. Yeah, it could be a machine or, or an algorithm that does that. It could be a person, but but that just not going to work anymore. You have to understand uh, the story behind it. Uh, and I think, and, and that brings us to the, the second shift. It um, basically Apple is telling the market uh, a pretty co coherent message. I mean, they're building the App Store uh, to be a, a centric uh, centric way of how. Teams should acquire users. Um, with iOS 15, they're launching custom product pages. So um, basically, they're allowing for the first time to create these kind of uh, funnels, I would call it, where mm -hmm. you can have an ad and a campaign leading towards a... Uh, leading towards uh, a specific custom product page with unique messaging, exactly uh, achieving what you just described. If you have somebody 
coming in uh, with a certain motivation. You can create a holistic funnel that ends in the App Store. Um, they're doing that also with in-app events, like allowing you to acquire more users through the App Store with a lot of visibility uh, through these uh, App Store in-app event uh, entities. Um, do you think the App Store should take a, a bigger role in, in, in the way that marketers uh, work and look for growth? I think so, yeah, because um, at the end of the day, um, kind of it doesn't matter which marketing activity you're doing. If you're running ads on Facebook, if you're running ads on TV, if you're you know, handing out flyers or something like that. In the end of the day, people will land on the App Store page where you have to convince them once again, so to say, or finally to click on the download button and to download the app. And so therefore, I think that exactly this kind of breaking point at the end of the day, which is, I think, one of the most important points throughout the complete uh, journey of a user, uh, is uh, very, very crucial to success. And so therefore, I think it was a really great step that Apple is doing here uh, to provide uh, app marketers with more possibilities um, of creating different storefronts, or in other words, of uh, having the possibility to create different landing pages. Um, which can then be also really, once again, uh, aligned to the complete uh, journey. Yeah? So, for example, if we think of an app where you can uh, book uh, flights and you can book hotels. I mean, two different use cases. Yeah, at the end of the day, they somehow are connected to each other. Yeah, but uh, there are obviously people that are only interested in flights and there are people that are only interested in hotels. And when my app provides both use cases, I now have the possibility to create two different landing pages for exactly the one use case uh, or optimized for the specific use case. And there I can also make it very, um, I would say, frictionless uh, for users at the end of the day, because I want also, I think one of the, um, the jobs uh, that we as marketers have to do is to uh, remove friction as good as possible from every kind of funnel, from every journey, uh, just to make people, uh, let them flow through and uh, without any uh, obstacles in the way, in their way. And so therefore, I think having this possibility of creating different landing pages, uh, optimized exactly for different user flows, removing friction, I think that this is a really great opportunity and uh, it makes the App Store just way more um, of this uh, yeah, a centric part of the journey that it already is, uh, but to give it more possibility uh, there as well uh, to make it even more powerful. Yeah, I mean, from marketers I've been speaking with, um, one of the really cool things about uh, both in-app events and custom product pages is it, that, that it allows marketers um, to, to win new audiences, to basically break into new markets. Uh, most apps, if you think about it, have this kind of, you described a flight app that also uh, offers hotels and flights. Uh, there's um, apps like uh, Twitch that offer a lot more than just uh, streaming games. There's um, a, a, a lot of other audiences that use uh, Twitch, but it's outside of their core uh, USP. But with custom product pages and in-app events, you can basically tap into the, the, the vast audience of uh, App Store uh, visitors. Basically, there's 500 million users visiting the App Stores a week. Um, and, and show your app in a completely different way and, again, create these funnels. So I think that if you, for whoever listening to this podcast, if you listen to what uh, the the world is telling you, on one hand, there's this move into a privacy first world where you can't uh, target high quality users the same way you did before. On the other hand, Apple is is leaning into this change and, and telling you create holistic install funnels uh, that goes from uh, for every type of USP and motivation users might have to install your app, going from uh, campaign to ad creatives to, to store creative um, and grow like that. So that's really cool. Um, I want to pick up your brain a bit about where you think Apple is going with this move. Like we, if we look at the past two years, the past two years, um, we, we see Apple, first of all, making this move with uh, the IDFA, which weakens a ton of ad networks, basically Facebook, I think, is uh, the company that got hurt the most. Um, really expanding search ads, their own ad network, uh, and now building all these marketing tools within the App Store. What, where do you think Apple is going with all of this? 
Yeah, I mean, kind of uh, Apple is one of the most valuable companies on this planet. And uh, there is a reason for that in the background. I think this is really part of their DNA um, to kind of uh, really think of where can we make uh, the most money uh, and how can we optimize our margins. Um, and I think that the, this kind of mindset is, mindset is now also um, yeah, swapping over to the app uh, store ecosystem there as well. And I think, as you mentioned, yeah, with IDFA, um, yeah, the biggest loser of it is uh, obviously Facebook. Yeah, um, and the biggest winner probably will be Apple. Maybe not yet, but uh, I'm quite sure in the future for sure. And uh, by doing all these steps, and by also on the other hand, uh, being also, I mean, you know, they own the ecosystem. Yeah, they 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 own the devices, uh, they own the app store, and at the end of the day, yeah, they kind of you know like the, that's their inventory, that's their uh, what they built up over the years. So therefore, I also kind of understand yeah, why they want to push more on this side and uh, also take more out of their ecosystem that they are creating and sharing it less with other companies, so to say. So therefore, I think uh, the moves that we're seeing, I would say maybe some of them or they kind of, yeah, we can say they are now privacy um, motivated to, to a certain extent, but I think we can also be very realistic here and say that they're also monetary driven or uh, yeah, to a certain extent at least. Um, so I think what Apple is just uh, trying to do here is uh, yeah, to also improve the margins of their ecosystem that they're owning. And uh, with all those steps, uh, I think they're kind of pointing into a direction that uh, we will be seeing Apple becoming more and more stronger also within the advertisement space. Um, and I think um, also there, if we compare it with Google, uh, where we can see that uh, the Google Play Store, uh, as well as apps for Android, uh, still most of them are monetized through ads, uh, which are owned by Google at the end of the day. Um, now we can say, okay, we don't have a Google ad mob, uh, we don't have an Apple ad mob uh, yet, <laughs> but uh, also let's see, uh, maybe this can also change within the next couple of years, uh, where Apple is also might be going down the route of thinking, okay, how can I even more monetize uh, the users of my ecosystem? And uh, looking at the past of Apple, I... I, I see quite good chances uh, that they might be also be very motivated to, to to think about how can we get more out of our ecosystem. Yeah, I, I it's funny to think about it. I remember chats I had like four or five years ago about like why Apple is not offering attribution, for example. I mean, they can do it very easily. Now we mm. see it with SK Ad Network, um, and most people in the industry said. They don't really want to go into that business. They have no interest in that whatsoever. But what changed in the past five years is that Apple really increased their services revenue. The App Store is a huge part of it. Um, we they, It got so big that now different companies and jurisdictions are um, going to court with Apple, mm. like against their 30% fee or preventing uh, users from you know making in-app purchases in a non-Apple way, uh, what we saw now with Epic Games and, and that court uh, battle. Um, but but basically, I, I think that there were two parts there. One of them is that Apple really believes in privacy. I think it's it's real. I mean, it's it uh, it, it also has a business value, of course. They want to be mm. uh, the ecosystem where users uh, that users can trust. Basically, that you know, if you get an iPhone, uh, your data is more secure and. People can track you the same as they can on on other operating systems. And the second thing they they got really pissed about, I think, was the fact that the main way that people in the world discovered apps was through Facebook and Google by seeing ads uh, while they were browsing either one of Google's uh, assets or uh, Facebook. And of course, there's the other social media companies, there's Snapchat or TikTok, uh, but it got to a point where that was the main way for people to discover apps. Uh, if you took that as a percentage from all installs globally. Um, and they wanted to change that and they wanted to make the app store the main way that users discover apps because they can control the experience uh, they can make it. Uh, they can make it a better experience in their view. If you think about it, they can control ads on Facebook. Um, there's things like fake ads that we see from time to time, and they don't like it. Uh, so they want to get into that, and of course, it's a huge market. There's 
more than $200 billion going into mobile ads every year. And that number is growing pretty fast. Um, and they're, they're positioned in a really great way to take a huge chunk out of that. So um, building their own attribution solution, uh, opening up an ad network, which is search ads that was expanded to Apple News and Apple Stocks, um, giving more tools in the app stores like custom product pages to measure to measure success of different funnels because you can basically um, measure revenues per custom product page. So it's another alternative way to attribute uh, success or revenues to a certain campaign in a world where you can't do direct attribution uh, in an accurate way anymore. Um, so, so I agree with you. I think that we'll see Apple moving into the space more aggressively in the next couple of years. Uh, and I think it might be pretty reasonable to think that Apple will offer a product for app developers or game developers uh, that offer them to show Apple ads within their games and apps and to monetize their, their products like that. Uh, and they'll wrap that in a messaging where, you know, this is the only privacy first ad product for apps and games. So, so use that. Um, so, so I think that that is a possibility. Uh, nobody can tell the future, but all we can know is that if Apple choose to do so, nobody can stop them. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's going to be an interesting few years. Yeah. And I think the question here is, uh, you know, taking this uh, thought further, yeah. The question is if they're going to build something like that by themselves or if they're going to acquire a company that already has built that. I mean, that's very speculative now uh, to talk about this, but uh, I think uh, it will be a very, uh, yeah, a very interesting times ahead of us. And uh, then we will also get answers to these questions. Maybe they also completely stay away from this space and uh, just monetize uh, with, uh, like you mentioned, yeah, expand and search ads uh, through their own products, uh, so to say. But yeah, let's see. Yeah, I, I think what's missing there, uh, if we take it even to a more speculative place, because it's fun, um, <laughs> it's fun to think like that. <laughs> so uh, basically what prevents them from growing search ads more is inventory. Like yeah. everybody really wants search ads uh, traffic, uh, but you can't scale budgets on search ads beyond a certain level because there's just so many people searching for keywords in, in the App Store. Uh, and what Facebook has that they don't is, is huge inventory. They have Instagram, they have Facebook, uh, and Apple doesn't have anything remotely close to that. So either we'll see them acquire, um, I don't know, a company for the purposes of getting more inventory, um, or to just understand that the, the, the number one way for them to get more inventory is to offer developers to uh, have, I don't know, an SDK that shows ads within uh, apps and games and, and they'll do it like that. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting few years, I think. Yep, me too. <laughs> For sure. So, uh, Thomas, we're running out of time. Uh, I just mm -hmm. want to ask you a few questions that we ask every guest. Uh, so just the first thing that comes to mind uh, for uh, these questions. Uh, if mm -hmm. you could give just one tip to somebody, an aspiring mobile growth marketers that uh, uh, getting into the industry today, uh, what would it be? Um, I would say uh, use App Radar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Storm Maven. And Storm Maven. And Storm Maven yes. These are the first two purchases you need to make. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so with the help of App Radar, you can uh, analyze your keyword rankings. You can identify really cool keywords for your app. Uh, you can also identify for which keywords your competitors are trying to optimize for. And with Storm Maven, you can obviously uh, optimize your conversion rates within the store. So I think this is a really great uh, combination. So sign up for AppRadar as well as for Storm Maven if you're starting out new the app business or if you're already there, uh, <laughs> there is always a good time to start with those two tours. <laughs> cool. Uh, and what's the uh, your favorite mobile growth resource? What do you read uh, that people should know about? Uh, I'm reading the the cohort uh, newsletter uh, that I'm getting on a daily basis. Uh, they're summing up uh, really great news uh, that are happening within the mobile industry, and uh, yeah, that's really my go-to newsletter that I read uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's it's really great. Sign up for that uh, if you don't read it uh, yet. Uh, who's the person in mobile growth uh, that you would most want to take uh, for lunch, and why? 
Yeah, uh, so kind of, uh, I would say the one of the, the the godfathers of marketing, I would call him, is Andrew Chen, uh, mm -hmm. who was uh, responsible for growth of Uber uh, when they started out, uh, now working for Anderson Horowitz. Um, he also runs a, a blog um, as well as uh, there is a lot of really great uh, information from him around the internet. Uh, yeah, he's just, uh, as mentioned, one of the godfathers of marketing in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely agree. And uh, almost lastly, what is uh, your favorite flavor of pancake? Uh, I would say vanilla is my favorite fa flavor of pancakes. Vanilla pancakes. That, uh, that, that's the popular choice, you say, in Austria. Awesome. Uh, and finally, where, where can people find you if they want to reach out, chat, know anything about the app radar? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the easiest way to contact me is on LinkedIn, uh, Thomas Kribanek, uh, and followed by Instagram, where I'm also very active. Uh, so you can find me on those two networks. Uh, just connect with me, send me a message. Uh, happy to chat. Awesome. Cool. So thank you very much uh, for doing this, Thomas. I had a, a blast and I'll speak with you soon. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was Mobile Growth and Pancakes. To find out more about StoreMaven and how we can improve App Store performance, visit StoreMaven.com. And then make sure to search for Mobile Growth and Pancakes in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at StoreMaven, thanks for listening.